Hi. So initially, I wasn't sure what to do my TED Talk on, but I figured doing it on something that I know about would be easier than researching something completely new. So I'm going to talk about how to DJ with a computer. Now, I know when you think of a DJ, you generally think of someone who has turntables and a lot of audio hardware. While it is incredibly useful and definitely recommended to have hardware in addition to your computer if you are DJing live in front of an audience, it's not necessary if you're completely new to DJing and want to take it up as a hobby. If you are interested in hardware, I've included a list of some of the better options for hardware that are currently on the market in the description below. But for the most part, I'm not going to talk about hardware. Which brings me to part one, software. If you have a Mac or an iOS device, I would highly recommend looking at DJ, which was developed by Algorithm, and it's currently the software I find myself using Apple promotes it highly for its UI design. I personally think it's easier to learn some of the core concepts with DJ on a Mac as a beginner. It also works well for more advanced users since it makes use of some of Apple's core audio for more native effects. And it's not too pricey, so that's also good. For both Mac and PC, another good option is Virtual DJ. It's free to download, and if you pay $100, you'll also have access to their online resources, which include an effect add-ons to extend your toolkit there. Part 2, Music Discovery. Now, probably you're already doing this, to some extent. And so, I mean, if you've got a method that works currently, um, go, feel free to keep doing that and tune out for what I'm saying for the next few seconds. This is just my advice on how I would focus it, I guess. So obviously this depends a bit on what kind of music you want to discover and on your current skill. As an example, for reasons I'll get to later, it's easier to DJ electronic and electronic dance music than it is to DJ classical or rock. But regardless of genre, I would recommend having various sources of music discovery. Like, just going off of only Pandora or only iTunes, there's not necessarily a problem with that, but you want to really delve into the genre and not just hear the same most played songs all the time. I would also say that listening to what other people are listening to in the genre is a good strategy. I mean, there's obviously the top charts, but I'm not just talking about that. Like, just, heck, listen to online radio, listen, go to concerts, listen to what other artists are listening to. It really doesn't matter. Just any music you, anyone is playing is can serve as inspiration, you know. You don't want to discover music in, like, a vacuum or anything. Part 3, The Circle of Fists. So here's how this works, for those of you who don't know anything about music theory. So the major keys are in on the outer ring, so this ring here, um, and the minor keys are on the inner ring, so here. Major and minor keys at the same position on the circle of this, so that would be here, and here. You get the idea. Those keys have the same key signature, or number of sharps or flats. So adjacently positioned keys, um, so that would be here and here, here and here, and so on. Those are each a fifth away from each other, hence the circle of fifths. Each key has a scale, or a progression of notes associated with it. And a given song will usually stay within the same key, which can be used to our advantage when DJing. So how does this work in actual DJing, um, in practice? Well, let's do an example. So, let's say we have a song in C major. So, here. And we go want to go transition to a new song. Well... To do that, we any basically we use the circle of fifths. Any key of the keys I'm going to select is are basically the ones you can transition to, since the keys are only a fifth away. One of the nice things about DJ is that it can analyze the songs in your library and organize them based on key into the circle of fists. Uh, virtual DJ will analyze the pitch, but you need to know the circle of fists for that to be helpful. With DJ, you can put two songs 
that will transition well on the turntables and have something that sounds good very quickly. They have this nice little um, view of the circle fist that allows you to sort through it in your library that should be popping up in an image right about there. Part 4, Beat Matching. So beat matching is all about tempo. Most songs have different tempos. So you can imagine that if I'm going from a really fast song over here to a really slow song over here, it may be a bit jarring if it's not done properly. And with beat matching, the tempo can be changed so that relative to the other song, you hear the beats at the same point in time each time it's you're hearing it. One thing to note about beat matching is that it's not all that great if you're not dealing with electronic music. The reason being is that an instrumental list will tire and they only have so much stamina to keep playing before they need to do something else like eat or sleep or whatever. What this means in real time is that the tempo is going to change for an instrumentalist. Maybe not instantaneously, but definitely um, over an extended period of time. A computer doesn't have that constraint, so you can have it play the same thing for a week and if you felt like it, and there'd be no problem. It would still probably play at the same tempo. Part 5, Equalization. So equalization consists of bass, mid, and high ranges, which correspond to the pitch ranges within a given song. Uh, bass sounds are generally the loudest, so you don't want to turn those way, way up, because um, that's going to be, like, loud, very loud. You, you do not want that, basically. I find that one way that to think about equalization that, or EQ as, it, uh, as it's often called, um, it, that often helps me, is um, as optimizing your volume levels for listening to your mixes on many different devices. Like, you know, like, no one likes um, putting in their headphones and pressing play, then realizing that the volume level is really loud, and then turning it way, way down. So just keep that in mind as you're working with EQ, and it'll all go fine. Part 6, Effects. So effects are pretty much up to you. Um, this is all you're doing in real time, so my recommendation here is to just practice, 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 and use whatever effects you can, and hopefully you'll get better. Part 7, Instrumentals and Acapellas. So this is a slightly more specialized piece of advice, but if you're actually interested in doing this now, I would definitely encourage you to try and do this. So another thing that helps is to find the solely instrumental version of the track or a solely a cappella version and get it onto your computer. And one technique that works very well with the live performance with this is to have a song people will know mixed with the a cappella of another song that people will know. You've probably heard this done live before, um, you just didn't know what they were doing, probably. Um, but now you know. So another thing I forgot to mention was the crossfader, which is kind of important. Essentially what the crossfader is, is um, it's this little bar, there, it should be visible right now, um, and basically um, when it's in the middle like it is now, you can, um, you're playing both songs at the same time, and when it's uh, to one side or the other, you're playing one, just a single table. And the other table is um, may or may not be going, um, but it's still there, and you can basically do whatever you want with it without people hearing. With hardware setups, you can get more complicated with this and have stuff you're doing with headphones um, that people are not hearing. It's kind of complicated, basically.